the thumb drive was or the system is or this one. I started to do something before that was really that was really bad. I had it still had it open, but had removed the thumb drive. Yep. Okay. All right. That's I'm gonna go ahead and put it up. Okay. Okay. Stop this music and you're good to go on your own. Okay, that's Oh, sit down, sorry. All right, good to see everybody today. Let's get this thing going. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am Doug Bradburn. Uh, welcome to Mount Vernon. Welcome to the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington, which is where we are. I'm the founding director, and this is our Ford Evening Book Talks. You know, the Ford Motor Company has been a great supporter of Mount Vernon since Henry Ford donated the first fire engine to the estate. We want to make sure that the mansion uh, doesn't burn down and that's been a long time uh, concern of ours and, uh, and an ongoing issue. But we're really thankful to Ford, the Ford family and the Ford Motor Company for their continuing support for all of our projects. Mount Vernon, of course, doesn't take any government money. It's all supported by private funds, so we depend upon uh, people uh, patriotic citizens around the world to support the mission of educating people about George Washington's life and legacy. Uh, it's great to see everybody out here tonight and it's great to welcome C-SPAN as well and C-SPAN's audience uh, to this uh, wonderful evening lecture. So uh, welcome guys, this is going to be a great evening. This is our, our evening book talk and this is uh, December, as you all know, the end of the year. This is the end of our first year of evening book talks, which we kicked off in January of last year. And for some of you who may have been here at that time, we've really had a, a diverse group of scholars and talks and we began uh, in January of last year with a book called Where the Tri Cherry Tree Grew and it was about George Washington at Ferry Farm in Fredericksburg, so about Washington uh, his boyhood and in fact the way people remembered that boyhood over time and it's somewhat fitting then that we're ending uh, the year tonight looking at a sequence of events that are really uh, partly about George Washington's uh, last great public uh, moment when he's leaving the presidency so we've kind of had in that 12 months we've gone from his boyhood uh, to his retirement essentially and, uh, and so it's a a nice symmetry that we like to see. Now, we have uh, an excellent uh, speaker tonight who I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Uh, Jeffrey L. Paisley, uh, Pasley, 
uh, this is an old tick. I've known Jeff for a while, and uh, an old tick I've had. Now, those of you who here, here, were here last month, we had um, Denver Brunsman, who you all remember was the valedictorian of St. Olaf's College. Well, in this case, we have uh, Jeffrey L. Pasley, who was not the valedictorian of Carleton College, the great enemy of St. Olaf. So uh, this is nice. And Denver, of course, that's right, that's right. He did graduate. It's, it's, I know he graduated and he did well because he went on to do his master's and PhD in history from Harvard University. In fact, he worked with the great historian Bernard Balin, uh, who really is one of the giants of early American history uh, and established many of the debates in the field. Uh, so tremendous uh, lineage, as we would say. Uh, but he, you know, uh, Jeffrey has moved well beyond the shadow uh, of, uh, of Bale, and he's now, of course, a full professor at the University of, of Missouri at Columbia, where he trains graduate students and undergraduate students. Uh, he's researches on American political history. He's written a number of different things. He's won a number of different fellowships and awards, and including the National Endowment for Humanities Younger Scholars Fellowship, the Mazur Fellowship in Arts and Sciences, the Artemis Ward Fellowship, the History Division Book Prize, uh, as well as other things. His earlier books, he's got edited volumes as well as books. His other major book, The Tyranny of Printers, is all about the role of journalists uh, in creating the early politics of America. Uh, he has an edited collection that's of some significance. I'll let him talk to you about that if he wishes. And this book tonight, The First Presidential Contest, The Election of 1796 and the Beginnings of American Democracy, was one of the finalists for the George Washington Book Prizes, as we know, which is a tremendous achievement uh, in and of itself. So would all of you please give a nice warm welcome to Jeffrey Pasley. Okay, let me make sure I've got all the, this is by far the most elaborate system I've ever <laughs> stood behind or in front of, and uh, I want you all to know that this is my, uh, this is a PowerPoint just like the ones I do for class, as in not designed for this. So. So don't expect whirling multiple images. It's not the National Constitution Center. It's just me. And uh, I'm also not at all sure what the resolution of some of these images is going to be. I hope it's good. Uh, so uh, for, for all of thanks for all of you, and just apologies to all of you and for the viewers at home. So I, I hope this, uh, I hope this, this uh, it looks reasonably well. Um, in case you all didn't know, C-SPAN, they kind of tell you they don't, you don't know like weeks in advance when C-SPAN's coming. It's just like, so I found this out like last night. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm slightly nervous about that and I don't know if this is really national TV ready, but let's give it a try. Uh, I was interested, of course, that uh, Doug couldn't speak the name of my edited book here in this place because it's called Beyond the Founders. <laughs> where we talk about, where we actually uh, talk about uh, political history, what political history would be like, uh, not without the founders really, but just uh, beyond them with other things alongside it. Uh, and in fact, this current book is actually a, a sort of return to the founders, so I guess I've, I guess it's not exactly a come to Jesus moment, but I guess it's close. Uh, at any rate, most Americans are, are proud to be Americans but not the, the, of their political system or the government that runs, I'm speaking of the present day. Congress's reputation is at an all-time low, for instance, and just keeps finding lower, really. Uh, the two-party system is so unpopular that one-third of Americans disclaim any part of it and considerably more practice that attitude by just not participating. The founders, on the other hand, continue to ride high in our esteem. It seems to be the great dream of every Washington journalist to, pub to publish a book about them and cop some of their popularity and gravitas. And even crusty, portly old John Adams got to be a TV star uh, once upon a time. Um, that's, this is actually an illustration that so I, I uh, actually wrote a column complaining about John Adams' mania as it existed back in the the time when uh, David McCullough's book was a bestseller and the HBO series was on. So this is like a sort of cheeky illustration that somebody uh, made for me to illustrate what I was saying. So, I, but I thought it fit for this. 
because uh, the founders are so popular that even John Adams got to be popular and he was never popular in life, right? <laughs> he was never popular in anything uh, in life, even when he won. So Americans still look up to the founders. Gallup regularly polls on the question of how the founders would feel about how the United States has turned out. Uh, turned out, and as of 2013, 71% said their early, their early American heroes would be disappointed. I'm not here to disappoint. I'm not here to dispute Amer Americans' love of the founders. I mean, that would be rather churlish to come to Mount Vernon and talk about how people shouldn't love the love of the founders. In fact, it might be illegal. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, for most, for the most part, uh, they were admirable, accomplished men of uncommon courage. Committed to what were in their day fresh and highly progressive ideas, though in their day obviously is a big is a big uh, a big proviso. Though mired in a social and economic system predicated on the perpetual enslavement of one group of people and the expropriation of another. Undoubtedly, the founders compare favorably to most of the people we watch on cable news every night. Those of you who can stand to do that, and I don't actually include myself uh, in in that in that number. The founders started governments rather than uh, shutting them down. Yet I think we do our era and theirs a disservice and cloud our vision if we put them up too far in the clouds. And here, I need to get this pointed in the right direction and make sure I... Okay, there we go. But I don't know what's going to happen if... Interesting. Well, anyway, so the apotheosis of Washington, uh, just as an example of that, just to, just just to say that the putting putting the founders up in the clouds is not me. That's not me hyperbolizing. That's something. It's the the roof of the U.S. Capitol and a number of other and a common thing even at the even at the time or the the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Um, that's actually, of course, the one on the. The one on the right up there, which of course, if you can't see unless you have telescopic vision or you're flying, but uh, when you get close up, that's what it looks like, I'm told. Politics was always politics, and many things we decry about the decline of American politics are actually things that were present from the beginning or before the beginning. And if there's any like sort of one message to my work, I think it's that. Other aspects of our political system, like political parties, the founders thought they could do without, but turned out to be very, very wrong. My book tries to explain what happened in the first con contested presidential election, while also shining some light on what has and has not, and ch not changed in 20, 220 years of American politics. Now, I'll say a word about myself is that, uh, and I don't mean about myself, about my approach. I would venture to say, and this is not something I disagree with us, I disagree with at all, that most professional historians tend to emphasize the idea that the past is a foreign country, far removed from us. And like I said, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But especially when dealing with the founders, I think it's useful sometimes, just sometimes, uh, to treat American, the American politics of the past as something that didn't happen in a foreign country, but happened in our country, as in the one that we still live in find uh, the connections uh, that go across time and see uh, and, and try to include it all in the same uh, mental space. That way we can hold the founders above ourselves only in the cases where that is actually warranted, which may be a lot of cases. Okay, so there's America. That's a, that's a sort of a contemporary map of America, as in from the time of uh, what the United States how far the United States went in the 1790s. And that's a sort of one that's actually from the time. Here's a later one that still is sort of crude, but shows the same, shows the same uh, places. As you can see, that's one that's actually trying to show population, not just, where, not just where the United States is. But as you can see, it doesn't go very far. One thing about American politics that has changed very little and makes a good place to begin is geography. Now, of course, there were a lot fewer states in 1796. Nashville, Tennessee was about as far west as you could have found a voter. Yet the basic structure of the electoral map was, electoral map was more or less the same as it would be uh, in Barack Obama's two presidential elections as it was when John Adams was elected. And so I'm getting the hang of this. OK, so that's, uh, that's John Adams. That's, that's 1796. 
and I, I've got I've actually on a separate going to avoid having to look as much if I catch up to this one. I've got a separate one up here, so I don't have to look back. I don't have to look to the left. So that's so you see the states only go so far, but you see the basic structure is uh, the same. New England on the one side. The lower south on the other, those are the two extremes uh, with the states in between uh, making the decision. And basically it boils down until Ohio came along and Ohio would be added to this. And then, of course, Indiana and Missouri, where I'm from, when Missouri exists, gets added to this. But in the old days, uh, it's pretty much a thing. New England was on one side, the lower south on the other. And it was pretty much a decision between New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. You got two of those three, you won. If you lost two and three, uh, you lost. And of course, obviously, three of three would be even better. Uh, you see that Jefferson carries Pennsylvania, uh, Adams gets New York and New Jersey, and so Adams is the winner. But so you go to 2008, and obviously, I should have, sh I should have, uh, whoops, I did it on me, but I did it on mine, but not yours. See, this is what's going to happen. So there's 2008. Uh, and if you have to just kind of avert your eyes to the left of the screen and veer to the right of the screen to kind of see the see this, this some of the same thing uh, where you've got uh, again the lower south especially the two to look for are South Carolina and Massachusetts especially or South Carolina and Connecticut South Carolina and Connecticut never inhabit the same the same space uh, whereas it's the states in between uh, go back and are, are the ones are the ones at the side and just quickly you see that it more or less uh, came out the same uh, in 2012. You can make the comparison even more detailed than that. Uh, Pennsylvania is the classic sw swing state, but in 1796, the real decider, uh, or one of the real deciders, uh, was the area we're in right now, Northern Virginia. Uh, that was always a place somewhat apart from the rest of the state, uh, even before the growth of the D.C. suburbs that, if I had a more detailed county-level map, you could see helped push Virginia to Obama in 2008 and 2012 and made Virginia uh, into a kind of swing state for the first time. In 1796, obviously Northern Virginia was not yet the D.C. suburbs, but it was just a somewhat less remote and more commercialized Virginia plantation district where some of the more ambitious landowners were developing towns and ca towns and canals and looking forward to trading, profiting from trade routes between the interior of the continent and the eastern seaboard. Of course, this is kind of all predicated on the idea that the Potomac was going to be the great uh, highway, to the, to highway to the interior, which did not pan out, but they thought it was. They thought it was going to pan out, and they kind of got the capital instead. Uh, with most of the state going heavily for Jefferson, uh, one, was, excuse me, So I have one more map that I forgot to I, f I forgot to do, which just shows you what happens in 1800. It's an illustration of what I was talking about. That when uh, Pennsylvania goes to Je New York goes to Jefferson in 1800, and then it's cleaned up. With most of the state going heavily for Jefferson, one of these landowners, Colonel Levin Powell, uh, pictured here, a military contract tractor. Uh, there's another Northern Virginia theme. I was quite amused to, to find that this uh, Northern Virginia lecture in 1796 was, was a military contractor. It's like, interesting. With most of this, uh, is also a flower manufacturer and the founder of Middleburg, Virginia. He ran for elector as a critic of Jefferson and shaved off one crucial Virginia electoral vote for John Adams of Massachusetts. That was one third of Adams' eventual margin of victory it came from Northern Virginia. And as you can see on the previous map, uh, the state legislature prevented such an outcome in 1800 by switching to the now familiar winner-take-all system of, of assigning their electoral votes. So Virginia, Virginia was, had, was on a district system in 1796, so Levin Powell, Colonel Powell, was able to shave off one vote uh, that became one of the three that puts, puts Adams over the top. Uh, but later, 1800, it goes to winner take all, and that's that's no longer possible. It's the state majority. So, could you guys turn off the sound of the PowerPoint? That's kind of an accident. Just if anybody's in the booth there, 
to mute that would be good because if there's any sounds in there, it's accidental. This is what I'm talking about, about how this is actually class PowerPoints that have suddenly appeared here, uh, which uh, occasionally have little wake up the students noises, which would not be, <laughs> which would not be appropriate on C-SPAN. Uh, you can just imagine, you know, uh, interstitial music, appropriate interstitial music, I guess, if any little noises go on. Of course, the story of this one elector's crucial role suggests a major difference between then and now. Electors actually did something in 1796. The Constitution as written both gives them a completely free hand in making the presidential selection and provides no instructions other than each state needed to appoint electors who would gather and vote in each state on the appointed day. Since neither Jefferson nor Adams nor Powell's first choice, Patrick Henry, was on any ballot, Colonel Powell had to go to the trouble of publishing a notice in the newspapers explaining to the world and the voters that he would vote against Thomas Jefferson if elected. And he did this most elaborately, but this was something that a lot of electors in 1796 had to go do. The nature of Powell's complaint about Jefferson will be more familiar, however, given the frequency with which it has been used against self-consciously or perceivedly liberal presidential candidates ever since. Drawing on his own experience as an officer during the Revolutionary War, Powell accused Jefferson, whose advocates touted him as the candidate of enlightenment and equality, as a weakling, a coward whose, quote, want of firmness and general incompetence had let Virginia be overrun by the British when he was go Virginia governor in 1781. Faced with a British army, Powell wrote, Jefferson had, quote, dwindled into the poor, timid philosopher, and another wrote, cut and run. That's another one that made me, like, drop out of my chair. They actually said that. That's actually in a newspaper from 1796, is that Jefferson would cut and run. A baby in his cradle, said another writer, could not have been more helpless uh, than Jefferson faced with uh, real men of the mil real military men. President Jefferson would surely leave the nation just as exposed as Governor Jefferson had left his state. As Powell intended, Adams supporters around the country made that item go viral, jumping from newspaper to newspaper around the country, reprinted or repeated until it was common knowledge. Powell became, Levin Powell became the toast of conservative Federalists for the rest of his life. Quote, wherever I went, I was known as the person who voted singly for Adams and put him in office. Now, almost nothing in the Levin Powell story shows the presidential election system going as the framers of the Constitution planned. Nothing goes as they planned. Parties are competing for the pre were competing for the presidency. Presidential electors were reaching out to the voters at large and campaigning for national candidates. This was not what was planned. The founders, uh, the founders hated political parties. Quote, the last degradation of a free moral agent, Jefferson called parties. In Boston, they raise a glass to the toast, may the kink, I'm going to take a drink, may the canker worm of faction never ascend the stem, nor blast the fruit of the tree of liberty. So, water. Because they would have done that with rum, and they had the, their, they'd have the banquets where the toasts go like 15 long, plus volunteers. So, uh, they could hold their liquor. The founders knew of no previous nation where two groups had battled for power over national government without one trying to overthrow the other, usually with violence, by revolution, or by one side inviting a foreign power in to settle the matter. In the 1790s, the founders could read about such occurrences as current events in France, in Poland, where it happened several times in this period, uh, including uh, the end of the revolution that poor Tadeusz Kosciuszko uh, led at one point uh, before he ended up in America, came back to America. And within living memory, 1745, Great Britain's opposition party had conspired, what we now think of as Great, Britain, Great Britain's opposition party, had uh, proved itself not a loyal opposition at all, conspiring with France and Scottish rebels to put the old Stuart monarchy back on the throne. And that happened when George Washington was a teenager. So they had examples. They had no examples of parties working out. They had many examples of competing for national power, uh, causing the end, you know, causing be, being a dreadful, a dreadful outcome. John Adams dreaded nothing so much to quote as a division of the republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. The framers not only left political parties out, framers of the Constitution not only left political parties out of the document, but set up the Electoral College partly to prevent parties from forming. 
The idea was that by having a, an independent electors voting on the same day but scattered in their individual states, the framers hoped to keep both the, both keep the presidential election away from the passions of the people and also to make it impossible for any parties or interests who might try to influence the outcome to coordinate their actions on a national scale. They were counting on the fact that communication and travel over so large a republic, which was large to them, uh, when you only had boats and horses as the mode of power, was very difficult, slow, and expensive. Now, we'll say the Electoral College, the Constitution has many great things in it. The Electoral College never worked once, right? I mean, it worked, to get, it worked when it was unanimous. It never, fa it never worked once under any sort of stress uh, whatsoever the way it was intended. Uh, acclamation for George Washington was the one time it went smoothly, and even then, there were actually problems. What the founders did not count on uh, was the bitter differences that immediately grew up among them almost the moment their new constitutional government was in place. Not just personal rivalries, but fundamental policy choices arose over what kind of republic the new nation would become, who would benefit, and what its place in the world was to be. People complain that politics is too polarized today, with Democrats and Republicans on every ballot and liberals and conservatives on every talk show panel. But if you want to know where polarization started, even where the hostility between left and right in American politics began, I would argue, look no farther than the founders the people they tried to rule over, and the com complicating world in which they all tried to live. Polarization, in other words, is us, and it's always been. With Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton installed as the two main pillars, okay, two main pillars of George Washington's administration, there we go. Ooh. Hamilton, now Hamilton has appeared. So Jefferson, I hope I don't. I'm sure I don't need to label these guys for y'all. Uh, so because I so I didn't. Uh, Jefferson on the left, Hamilton on the right. With these two guys impaled as in, impaled, <laughs> installed <laughs> as the two main pillars of George Washington's administration, the founders first quarreled. The founders first quarreled over had him, uh, Hamilton's plan to refinance the bankrupt republic by putting its money into the hands of Wall Street and, and Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, which is where the country's original financial center was. And I don't think I'm being, I don't think I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, partisan by saying that. Uh, that's, that was more or less literally what, 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 he, what he was trying to do. The Bank of the United States, created as part of Hamilton's program, was a privately controlled institution that received the privilege, the vast privilege, of holding the government's revenues in its vaults and then being able to make loans on that amount, or of course, as a multiple of that amount. This generated a huge windfall profit for investors in the U.S. public debt and a mass of potential capital for new business ventures. A good thing by Hamilton's lights. I mean, the, that's the, we, this was trying to do this. Though it seemed unfair to the, even if it was unfair to those without the resources or the foresight to hold on to government securities that had been nearly worthless for years. But this was horrifying to Jefferson and Madison and their supporters, who were not just Southern, and the supporters who were not just Southern planters and Western settlers, but, also, but eventually also a majority chunk of the craftsmen, workers, and poorer farmers of the Northeast, especially in the cities. So, for instance, Philadelphia area of Philadelphia uh, becomes one of the centers of uh, becomes one of the centers of, of Jeffersonian republicanism in the north. Hence one of the major themes in the National Gazette, a newspaper that Jefferson and Madison helped to start bro to broadcast their criticisms, is a familiar one in the annals of the American left. The way the finance industry and the government and the government policies that favored it Created, were creating social inequalities that would curdle America's hard-won liberties and betray the democratic promise of the revolution. So, on the, so this is what you have. On the right of, of early American politics, a, a group of politicians who enjoyed the support of the wealthiest Americans in the bulk of what we would now call the business community. Then it would be more likely called merchants or something like that. Uh, these defenders of the, government, of, the, of the Washington administration's policies came to call themselves Federalists after the pro-Constitution forces uh, during the 1787-88 ratification debate. And here, you, the party names are almost always either something somebody else called you or an attempt to criticize the other side. So 
the pro, the Hamilton the, the Hamilton supporters call themselves Federalists because that's the name of the people who supported the Constitution. The message there being that the other guys don't support the Constitution, that they're trying to overthrow it. If you're not a Federalist, you must be against the Constitution. Jefferson's group on the left of early American politics called themselves Republicans, in keeping with their claim that the inequality-loving Federalists secretly yearn for a monarchy, which they kind of use as their sort of all-purpose, sometimes talked about as a reality, sometimes talk about as, talked about as a kind of all-purpose symbol of inequality. Uh, so by calling themselves Republicans, they were claiming that the Federalists were in fact actually monarchists, not Republicans. The Federalists in return, and to explain how the names change later on, the Federalists in return taunted the Republicans as Democrats. As a word that, yeah, as Democrats, oh my God. A, a word that, conjured, that then conjured scary visions of social leveling, but eventually stuck as the preferred appellation for the party of Jefferson over a long process of the next uh, 20 or 30 years. And again, something that actually kind of comes out of Philadelphia, uh, adopting the word Democrat is, they're not insulting us, they're describing us. The terms left and right would not have been self-applied by American politicians in the 1790s, but they were not uh, anachronistic terms. I think I've, I think I've got it. So this, this is the National Gazette, which I'm not really going to talk about too much, but this is the newspaper that Jefferson, uh, Jefferson Madison helped start, actually, while Jefferson was still in office. That's the incident where uh, Philip Freneau, uh, fluent French, where, where Philip Freneau, the editor of the National Gazette, was hired as a French translator in Jefferson's office, which is kind of funny because Jefferson, of course, was a fluent French speaker and writer, and uh, the last job he needed in the last employee he needed in the world was a French translator. So he said, you know, whatever you want to do on the side, whatever you have your spare, do in your spare time, that would be fine, which turned out to be editing uh, this newspaper. As I started to say, the, le the terms left and right would not have been self-applied self by the 1790s, but they were not anachron they're not anachronistic. They were invented to describe the radical and more conservative factions of the French Revolution, an event that was unfolding across the ocean at exactly the same time. The French Revolution, or rather the proper American sp response to it, also happens to be the other major issue that divided the founders into competing parties. Jefferson and his followers thrilled to the French revolutionary vision of universal liberation, social equality, and at least what they thought was progressive rational government. Hamilton and his allies were horrified, on the other hand, by the dangers that the revolutionary spirit posed to law and order, the Christian religion, and the existing arrangements of society, including a hierarchy of wealth, property, and status, a hierarchy of wealth, property, status, and lifestyle that was far more pronounced then than it was now. This is still a time when no one did anything with their hands they could have, if they could afford a servant, have a, a servant or a slave do it for them, and when servants were actually necessary to achieve even what we now would think of as basic levels of hygiene. That is to say, you couldn't have clean clothes every day. Uh, you couldn't have uh, water to drink all the time if you didn't have, you couldn't pay uh, for servants or slaves, and so most people didn't. Now I think I got this, I think there's a, there's a, uh, there we go. It's out of order slightly there. When Edmond Genet, uh, Citizen Genet, the first diplomatic envoy from the French Republic arrived, American fans of the French Revolution started Democrat, what were called democratic societies that both celebrated the French Republic and criticized the Washington administration. Federalists considered them the vanguard of a new revolution that they, did not, they were not in favor of and a tool of foreign subversion. In reality, the democratic societies were more like the, the beginnings of an opposition party, but that was no reassurance given the fears that existed about parties. For most Federalists, and especially for President Washington, periodic elections were, were, were all the popular input that a Republican government required, and the only popular constitutional form. And they just meant voting, not everything that we now think of as going, to an elect, going into an election. Not a campaign, and certainly not constant criticism of a government uh, by, by some group of people between elections, the things that parties do. Uh, Constant criticism of the government between elections by people who had, no one had elected to anything was distasteful and dangerous. Federalists hoped, Federalists hoped it would go away, uh, and meant that many wished to make it go away. That is to say, this phenomenon of people 
out of, you know, out of doors, as they said, criticizing the government all the time. Uh, they, they wanted it to go away, and they tried to make it go away uh, when they got the chance. Later on, with the Alien and Sedition Acts, which was largely aimed at the opposition party. Uh, in the meantime, in, in this period that we're talking about, the largest army ever fielded on American soil was sent down to put, the, put down the Whiskey Rebellion, which Washington blamed on the Democratic societies, uh, mostly unjustly. The competing attitudes toward the French Revolution also led to the bitter debates over foreign policy. That in, and this is, this is the, the, uh, the slide that I had out of order. There's Chief Justice John Jay and his treaty is what you're looking at there. For, so foreign policy animates the politics of 1796 more than any other issue. Citizen Genet had come to seek American support in the French, in, in the French war against the monarchies of Europe that had broken out. Uh, to seek American support as a sister republic and as an old ally, as the people, as the French saw it, who had saved uh, the American Revolution back, back uh, during the war. The Washington administration responded by, by, uh, by making a proclamation of neutrality in the, in the European war, and then a commercial treaty with Great Britain, negotiated without too much vigor by a moonlighting Chief Justice Supreme Court, John Jay. Supreme Court had a lot of spare time in those days, so you could go off you could go off to London and negotiate treaties without causing anything to stop. Mass protests has erupted uh, when this treaty was announced uh, as, as, at the seeming betrayal that this treaty, rep the J Treaty, represented. The, the mass protests erupted, and those were followed by by a, tri a drive to derail Jay's treaty in the House of Representatives. Uh, which, of course, is constitutionally suspect since the, court, since the House of Representatives has no role in approving treaties. They were trying to innovate un unsuccessfully. Uh, that effort collapsed in the spring of 19, 1796. And after that, a presidential campaign with a competing candidate opposed to Washington and Hamilton's policies came to seem the opposition's only recourse. So the, the, the presidential election, the, first, the, the contestedness of the presidential election of 1796 comes directly out of these policy debates. It, doesn't, it isn't something that was just about Jefferson trying, uh, Jefferson and Hamilton or Jefferson and Adams struggling with each other. Hence, an outcome that the founders had devoutly wished to avoid emerged organically out of their own or competing beliefs and actions and the wide public support both, both sides were able to draw. With its own designers working to short circuit it, the indirect constitutional electoral system never had a chance. Long before 1796, the Republicans had attracted a news network of newspapers who could, that could speed their messages across the country. I say speed their message across the country meant they could, it happened in a, only a week or two, which was, of course, virtually uh, instantaneous uh, in their world when, uh, you know, when it took a day to get from Baltimore to Philadelphia, right? Uh, so in that world, a week's time getting a message all the way from up and down the eastern seaboard uh, in a week was a big thing. Uh, then the Democratic societies got into the act. The Federalists, for their part, had newspapers of their own, and they counted on the Democratic societies by drawing on the influence of their wealthy supporters. Ship owners, merchants, and insurers were urged to tell their employers and customers to support the Jay Treaty or suffer economic consequences. Uh, the, to manufacture a, public, a show of public support for the treaty, uh, to balance those mass meetings against it, petitions were printed up and sent to local communities with the place name blank. And the idea was that then a town meeting could be organized by the local merchants that would approve that message as their own and then send it back to Philadelphia with the blanks filled in. Fortunately, I don't have an illustration of that. Today we call that astroturfing. Uh, in other words, where you have a message, a pre-written message sent out, sent out from a central place that's then filled in uh, and sent back to sort of sit to, to, to present at least the illusion of a public groundswell of support. Tonight I'm going to skip over the slow process by which the various candidates emerged or flamed out. You can read about that at great length in my book, and I don't know if they have some here, but it's it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a page turner, but it will also and also a door stopper. So uh, <laughs> they'll just have very wide margins. At any rate, it has lots of things that I'm not going to be able to talk about, including the so the nomination process, uh, which of course isn't a process at all. It couldn't even begin until nobody could even say anything until Jefferson until. Washington's farewell address was released, which didn't happen until September. At any rate, by September 1796, former Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson and Vice President John Adams were generally acknowledged as the primary candidates, though neither of, no, though neither of them participated in the candidate campaign at all. 
Both were, both were mostly home on their farms, ignoring the whole thing. And James Madison actually didn't even communicate with Jefferson during that time because he was afraid Jefferson was going to abruptly resign from the race uh, if he would talk to him. Uh, so he just didn't even speak, didn't even communicate with him, at least in writing. Their surrogates were, however, were quite busy, mounting coherent but quite vicious campaigns that used the biographies and writings of the two major candidates, not unlike we would use it today, to show how they personified the divide that had opened up in American politics, including the beginnings of what we've come to call uh, the culture war. So let me go ahead a couple here. All right, there's John Adams. John Adams had a lot of free time when he'd been a diplomat uh, in the 1780s and when he, and especially when he was vice president from 1789 to, to 1789 to 1797, he had ample free time. And he'd used that free time to write thousands and thousands of pages on political philosophy, which he had published. And I should say, thousands and th he'd write thousands and thousands of pages, in, in some cases where he's copying, because he, uh, they didn't use quotation marks the way we use them that today. So there's an awful lot of Adams' writings on political philosophy that are actually other people's writings on political philosophy that he just kind of forgot to label as such. Uh, but it came back around to get him, because then he's blamed for the things that all these like sort of uh, uh, monarchs of the past had to say uh, got put at Adams's door. Adams's writings and the one that was this, this one that you're looking at here, Defense of the Constitutions of Government of the United States, uh, was the most commonly discussed one. They were full of gaffes, passages that could be taken out of context to show that Adams was in fact the sort of monarchist and would-be aristocrat that the Republicans had long accused the Federalists of being. In the crucial swing state of Pennsylvania, thousands of handbills were sent out listing the pro-Jefferson pro elector candidates. I know you can't really read that, but uh, I hope I can describe to you uh, what that is. At the top, it lists uh, at the top it lists the pro-Jefferson elector candidates in Pennsylvania. They had to do that because the Federalists that controlled the legislature in Pennsylvania and had passed a law saying you couldn't have printed ballots. You had to name every single elector. You had to write every single elector candidate on your ballot to have a valid ballot. So it's a kind of 1796 voter suppression tactic. I mean, quite literally, right? I mean, that's literally what they were trying to do. So the Republicans print out handbills to show, to make sure so people could copy exactly uh, what the, who the electors were, but they attached then uh, a, 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 a reading guide to, Je to John Adams' writings. Uh, especially, and these are page number, little pull quotes with page numbers attached uh, uh, that, to guide to reading the uh, defense of the American constitutions uh, to show you all the terrible things that Adams had said about how aristocracy was better, uh, that it was better to have rich people in office, that uh, that aristocracy and monarchy were inevitable, and it, about half of these are things that probably Adams himself didn't even say, uh, but they were things that were in the books. It all proved, uh, according to the handbill, that Thomas Jefferson is a firm Republican. John Adams is an avowed monarchist. Thomas Jefferson first drew the Declaration of Independence. He first framed the sacred political sentence that all men are born equal. John Adams says this is all a farce and a falsehood, one of the poll quotes. Which of those, Freeman of Pennsylvania, will you have for president? And in one of the 1796's only straight up statewide popular election campaigns for electors, most Pennsylvania voters uh, George, uh, chose Jefferson. Uh, there's another one of these handbills that quotes that, uh, that, that quotes Tom Paine talking about how Adams has sons and thus partly might partly be out to start a real monarchy. At any rate, uh, the Adams as monarchist and ad using Adams as writings as gaffes uh, helped out was one Pennsylvania for Jefferson. Now here at Mount Vernon, I'm of course not going to get into another part of the Republican campaign where Tom Paine called a certain personage a hermaphrodite, because uh, they were also attacking at the talking attacking George Washington as well. And he didn't really mean a literal hermaphrodite; he meant he had a hermaphroditic personality, uh, which we can talk in the Q and A what you know what the hell that means. Uh, it, it, he, he did have a meaning. Um, of course, it was John Adams who wins the election in the end. And here, much of the credit goes to figures that even many people who have read a lot about the founders have not heard of. I talked about uh, Colonel Levin Powell at the top of the, at the top of this talk, uh, but even more important was.
William L. Smith, or William, I'm not actually, I've had different reads on how to pronounce his middle name. I'm going with Lufton. We can just call him William L. Smith. A South Carolina congressman who, hoped, who, who was hoping for a diplomatic post in the Adams administration, maybe even the top one, though he didn't get that. Uh, Smith was one of the made Federalist major floor leaders in Congress, and he churned out a 25-part series of newspaper essays, essays that were later packaged as a two-part pamphlet, and you see one of the title pages here, that becomes the kind of the seminal hit piece in American presidential politics, sticking out themes that would be rolled out any time later a candidate was perceived as progressive or of the left. Smith made Jefferson into the original model of that favorite conservative target, the fake populist a pretended man of the people who was in reality an effete elitist, whose squishy soft political sympathies revealed the naivety of, of thought and a cowardice of character that rendered him totally unfit for office. Now I almost want to say he's the first limousine liberal, but of course that would be anachronistic, so we can go with, uh, I was playing around with what we go with instead, uh, and I, I decided on enslaving the egalitarian. Uh, and said so as another as another uh, alliterating alliterating idea uh, idea of the fake populist because Smith also originates the idea of attacking Jefferson of undermining Jefferson's uh, democratic politics by bringing up the fact that he was a slaveholder. Smith relied on Colonel Powell's account of Jefferson's behavior during the British invasion for his material on cowardice, but he also did a brilliant job of setting up Jefferson as the quintessential pointy-headed intellectual. Taking Jefferson's only published book, The Notes on Virginia, as his text, Smith lampooned Jefferson as the supposed scientist whose so-called so discoveries and, hope and homemade inventions amounted to no more than self-serving prejudice and laughable, laughable gimcrackery, like uh, an item that he made a lot of. The wonderful... This is an... Of course, these are some of his... his Jefferson, of course, if you've been to Monticello, you know Jefferson liked to invent home office... He, he liked to invent home office equipment as one of his great, uh, so he's got, this is his collection of home office equipment, and one of his, uh, one that he didn't invent, but he was, that he was, uh, became famous in various ways, partly through this, is what Smith called the wonderful whirly gig chair. In other words, his swivel office chair with little candle holders. Now, ironically, George Washington actually had this one before, one before he did, so it actually should be Washington's wonderful whirly gig chair, but this was uh, seemed so ridiculous to Smith that he turned this into a symbol of Jefferson's kind of, uh, of, of Jefferson's dottiness and, and, and silliness. Smith described Jefferson's furniture, in this piece of furniture, in a Swiftian mode. It has the miraculous quality of allowing a person seated in it to turn his head without moving his tail. Ha ha. At any rate, there was quite a bit of talk of the uh, of the whirly gig chair uh, in the Canada, in the Canada, in the campaign of 1796. And while it's a ridiculous issue, it's one that's actually highly symbolic of a more serious criticism that were, they were making. And, why, and, while, and while, Je while Smith mined Jefferson's writings for humor, he also honed in on more serious issues. He reminded Christian voters about Jefferson's liberal religious views and connected them to the excesses of the French Revolution that he uh, was such a fan of. Of course, the French Revolution, the French Republic, as you know, as I'm sure most of you know, abolished the Christianity at one point. At, be at best, it was another case of Jefferson's muddled, irresponsible thinking, Smith argued. Alexander Hamilton had actually originated this idea, had smuggled a dig in, at Jefferson on this theme into Washington's farewell address, released just before the campaign started. Extreme views on religious to toleration and liberty of conscience like Jefferson, who had said that he didn't care whether, you know, rhetorically, he didn't care whether there were a hundred gods or one, that it didn't break his leg or pick his pocket. Views like these were depicted as a character flaw and a failure of leadership. In vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. A mere politician ought to be more cautious about disturbing Christian beliefs and observances, uh, th these firmest props of the duties of men and citizens. Smith suggests that was Hamilton in the farewell address. Smith suggested worse. President Jefferson might be a danger to the Christian religion and Christian morals, uh, that the, you know, the Bible itself uh, might be in some danger. Again, the charge which comes up later uh, in American, American political history. Taken together, this was the first attempt in American history to marshal Christianity in the service of presidential politics. And it might be the first time, I, don't, I can't say this for sure, I, I think it's actually the first time that anybody used religion in a campaign for office. There certainly were arguments about laws and there were arguments about to toleration, but this is, I think, the first time when it becomes a campaign issue. Last thing I want to talk about tonight uh, 
is the most serious part of Smith's attack. Uh, and it's also probably the most surprising. Uh, these days, and I can tell you from teaching students, uh, most of what most people know about Thomas Jefferson at this point was that he was a slaveholder, and that, that makes him into a hip that makes his makes his democratic ideals and his other talk about liberty uh, into a piece of hypocrisy that we can mostly ignore. This comes this kind of uh, this line of attack comes straight from Smith's uh, pretensions of Thomas Jefferson, uh, and it, but it came out in a way that may be a little surprising. Because while we think of, I'm going to go on one more slide, you know, we think of Jefferson as a slaveholder primarily now, but that's not how Jefferson was seen in 1796. Jefferson was straight up, okay, you know, despite the fact he's a slaveholder, he was straight up seen as the anti-slavery candidate, as a candidate, as somebody who was for freedom and progress and equality, uh, who had said, who had put some of the most stirring words on paper that existed yet on this on this theme. Uh, so. When Smith goes to, to, to deal with Jefferson on slavery, he does two things. First, he does use the hypocrisy thing. He has long discussions of Jefferson's terrible passage in the, in the Notes on Virginia where he talks about, uh, this, where he gets into kind of biological racism uh, and sort of retails his theories about, about uh, biological theories about, uh, about black inequality. So uh, he, he uses the pocky, he, he counterposes that as he says, on the one hand, that's bad science. On the other hand, uh, ask how that can possibly comport with Jefferson's supposed anti-slavery views. But there was another purpose for to bring up slavery for William Lefton Smith. He was from South Carolina, and the Federalists were trying to get, uh, were trying to get Southern votes. Uh, another, another candidate, the, the, you know, there was an, their vi main vice presidential candidate, main vice presidential candidate was uh, General Charles Pinckney, uh, or Thomas Pinckney, excuse me, uh, from South Carolina. Later on in 1800, they nominated another Pinckney uh, for for, pres for for president. Uh, they intended to be a national party, and that meant bringing in that meant getting votes from the South. And uh, so Smith's way of using Jefferson's anti-slavery views is to suggest that Jefferson is a danger to slavery, uh, that Jefferson's muddle-headedness and that his commitment, his thoughtless commitment to upending existing social arrangements might extend to, uh, to endangering the South, to endangering, uh, endangering the South by freeing the slaves. Uh, and he even then goes on to attack, uses as his example, Jefferson's famous letter to uh, Benjamin Banneker, the black uh, surveyor and almanac maker. There's one of, one of Banneker's almanacs. Uh, Jefferson, of course, and this is an exchange of letters that gets brought up against Jefferson because there's certainly some condescending aspects to that letter. But the very fact that Jefferson had exchanged letters uh, with Banneker uh, was, sent off alarm bells, according to William Lefton Smith. He called it the fraternizing epistle, that if Jefferson was willing to lower himself to write a letter uh, to a black person, that he might be willing to lower all the other barriers as well. So Jefferson uh, basically was damned if he was anti-slavery, damned if he wasn't, uh, looked like a hypocrite and an unfit person for office one way or the other. Uh, and those are really actually just a few of the attacks, of the attacks that Smith comes up with, just three of the main ones. Let me finish by just reminding you, of course, that uh, by, the, by the time this election was, was through, the constitutional electoral system was thoroughly broken, right? Was thoroughly broken. You ended up with a situation where John Adams comes in first, but his opponent ends up as his understudy. Thomas Jefferson, his vice president. Thomas Jefferson, having to go to Philadelphia all the time, not being able back on the plantation, uh, has a lot more time in his hands to actually get involved in political campaigns in a way he hadn't been before. And he's right there with access to all the newspaper editors, all the documents, and spends four years working against Adams, uh, working against Adams uh, at, after they're elected, and ends up uh, then, of course, causing an election to come out tied again in 1800. And finally, after 1800, after the tie between Jefferson and Aaron Burr, you end up with a situation where the founders finally admitted their mistake and uh, wrote political parties into the Constitution by actually allowing electors to cast separate votes for, for president and vice president, acknowledging the fact that there actually were going to be national organizations. That actually, it was easy to come up with a national political party, that uh, slow communications was no problem at all, and that polarization was going to be the norm in American politics from here on out. So that's, that's, I think I've done enough time, and thank you for listening today.
second chapter is fantastic. It's, it's a great book, of course, as well. And many thoughts come to mind as I have the privilege of asking the first kind of questions here. You know, you describe a, a situation in which polarization, frustration, uh, a real sense that the political system isn't working the way people wanted it to work is being basically there from the beginning in American politics. Why does this country uh, succeed under the Constitution uh, in the 1790s and not go the way of so many other uh, countries who, who create their independence in the midst of war, try to set up a functioning government, then fall into uh, anarchy, other revolutions, breakdowns? Uh, what, what about the American political system, as frustrated as people are with how they perceive it should work and whether it does work, what, what aspect allows it to sort of persist in that, in that early period? I think there's a lot of things you could say. I think Americans are very devoted to their dreams. And when I say, when I say that uh, the founders acknowledged political parties in the Constitution, of course, they didn't do that literally. They just made a, put a provision in uh, that actually kind of accounted for that, just the same way uh, slavery is protected in the Constitution but isn't actually mentioned. So in some respects, we just people just kept on despite the fact that, you know, committed to the system, despite the fact that it was broken. Um, I think if I had to really give a sort of serious, uh, you know, a serious all-time answer to the other question, I would say that uh, I don't think there's necessarily a structural reason. I think that American elites perhaps were not as far apart as they sometimes thought they were. That uh, when it came down to it, you know, there are several moments where, uh, things happened that were not carried as far as they could. So the, the Federalists do pass the Sedition Act, right, when they, after Adams comes in, and they, partly because of this, of the election of 1796, that they remember they'd almost lost power and they wanted that not to happen again. But they kept it within the legal system. And, you know, they, they, they abuse the law, you know, they don't allow truth as a defense, and they do various things that are abusive, but they don't get to the point of just rounding everyone up, right? Uh, they follow the law, you know, they put people in jail for six months, they put people, you know, they, they harass them with, with legal proceedings, but in fact it wasn't enough to actually scare anyone. Uh, that with Republicans to back them, that, you know, by the time the Sedition Act's meant to shut down the Republican press, as I talk about in my other book, I guess this is a plug from, turned into a plug from my other book, is that uh, they were trying to shut down the press, but their Sedition Act wasn't scary enough to actually shut anything down. Uh, that more newspapers were appeared by the end of that than at the beginning. Similarly, uh, there's a couple points, you know, the electoral tie of 1800. Federalists could have, they had the, you know, they, they could have blocked Jefferson becoming president, right? They could have done that, right? They could have put in Aaron Burr, uh, and probably then there would have been a civil war probably was sparked then, right? Virginia was ready, was ready to go to, was ready to, go to war if they'd put someone besides Jefferson. On the on on the throne, sorry, on the on the in in power, uh, at the end of the election in 1800. Though in the law letter of the you know in the letter of the Constitution, the Federalists would have had a perfect right to do that. So I mean I don't mean to put it down to kind of personal. You know the Federalists they blink, people blink at various times or don't go uh, to the end. Well, it's it's a great uh, argument you make. It's so challenging and the rhetoric is so inflammatory. Uh, the character of the debate is so outrageous, and, the, and yet they don't go to the Civil War in that moment. But of course, America does have a Civil War. These guys, many of these guys, have lived through a revolution in which they did go to war over principles. They understood their interests. They understood them. And so uh, it is. It is a. It is something I think that your book um, helps highlight. Uh, that there may be a more, uh, there's a certain stability and continuity in American politics, but there is a certain fragility as well. But these, this rhetoric is is real. People do mean it. They do get impassioned about right. it. Right. But there has to be at some point a shared understanding of the rules of the game. Right? I mean, there is. I guess I think I'm not. I'm not sure it's always a self-conscious of that. And I guess I think that when we go in that direction, we tend to just that tends to be the the sort of line of thought that leads us just to kind of set aside that set aside some of these political conflicts that I'm talking about to say, oh, well, they're such great men. You know, they got along in the end. They came together as founding brothers. You may have heard that term uh, in the end to, to help us through these troubled times. And I guess I think that takes away from some of it. It doesn't allow us to kind of see some of the things that we actually have in common with them. Yeah. Well, 
Excellent. That's fantastic. Well, let's open it up. One thing, because C-SPAN's here, we have microphones that are going to go around the room to wait uh, to actually speak uh, until you get your mic. All right, so who's first? What we got? Yes, sir, right here up front. Wait for the microphone. And then the gentleman in the camel in his jacket. Thank you. Um, you've sort of raised uh, or tipped uh, into the sectional differences that right. ultimately resolve the breakup of or the attempted breakup of, of the union. What were the key policy issues, though, of 1796? What were the pro issues looking to the future that they were sort of battling? Well, whether Hamilton's, as I kind of tried to address in, in the middle of the talk, they were, it was the financial system, you know, whether or not, basically whether or not uh, the United, the government policies were going to lead to kind of capital development and building financial industry and led to rapid economic development. You know, Hamilton's kind of uh, finance, the plans behind Hamilton's financial system. And the other one was foreign policy, uh, you know, basically whether or not, uh, the, whether or not America was going to try to operate basically within the British colonial system, you know, independently, but sort of reach an accommodation with the British or whether we were going to join, uh, you know, be uh, joined with France uh, in a, against the monar against the monarchists. But basically it comes down, 1796, it comes down to straight up Britain versus France to the point that France is like actually, uh, one of the things I didn't say in this talk that I sometimes say is that the French actually gave us democracy. The French spent a lot of time, actually spent money in Philadelphia trying to urge Americans to have, you know, you should, you should decide to vote yourselves, right? You should, if you, if you like France, you should vote that way. Uh, and in fact, the lease, lease of the, the J Treaty, the text of the J Treaty was leaked because a uh, French paid a Virginia senator to do it, actually, or at least they paid. It's not clear whether it was a bribe or whether it was just they were paying for the printing costs. Uh, so those are the policy. So those are the policy so it was issues. Mason, was it? Was it, Thomas it was Stephen Thomas Thompson Mason. Yeah, it was from right around here, right? That's right, right down the road. Four months. Right, good evening. Is it fair to say that um, in the run up to the revolution, you know, uh, that that first introduced the political party system in a way, maybe it's just uh, regionally and, and as well as uh, you know, socially, but so. 1796 and then 1800, uh, our um, forefathers and the colonists, they were not uh, novices to the political system. So this was just a new structure now because we're running, you know, we have a president, right? So, right. Uh, so is that a fair statement? And then maybe the um, George Washington's um, presidency was the anomaly where everybody came together and that wasn't the reality. Well, I think that's probably right. I think certainly the tendency to polarization was there. I think the difference uh, is that there was no national structure uh, in, in it before the revolution. So, the, yeah, there are individual colonies had had their little mini party systems, had their kind of ongoing battles. Uh, but they tended to be a bit more structural, where there'd be one side would be generally in the, with the royal government and the other side wouldn't. And they'd also be much more localized. I would say, um, in terms of the run-up to the revolution, uh, you know, the patriots and Tories, or whatever you want to call the loyalists and patriots of the revolution, that would be another example they had of a, of a party a party system that did work, right? In the sense that uh, they didn't end up, you know, they ended up uh, not only fighting but you know, ser taking serious actions against each other. And in fact, going back to Doug's question, if the Either the Republicans and the Federalists, when they were in power, had acted like the Patriots did during the Revolution and took away people's property and exiled people and, and uh, executed people, then it would have been a whole, you know, that was a whole other example they had of how this could be handled. And that, I actually think that's another, re you know, that's kind of in the back of their minds that they don't, they've been there and they don't want to go there in this case. So, you know, I, I have a pretty loose, I, I, among historians, I guess I tend to use the word party a little bit loosely. I guess I would say party system or even party should probably be reserved for the idea of like an ongoing thing where you're going to have these, you're going to battle for votes and not, uh, and not necessarily come to blows. But I, I mean, I think you're, you're being too harsh on yourself there because there has been such a social scientific effort to define party so rigidly. Therefore, they never exist. Real parties, yeah. proto parties, and all that. You know, when, when Madison writes that great essay on party, right? Yeah. On party, he describes the two. He's talking about the, what is about to become the third party system that he's about to start, 
Because the first one is the is the Patriots and the Tories. The second is the Federalists and the Federalists. Any Federalists. The ratification debates. And then the third is going to be this, this, this majority faction that he wants to organize against Hamiltonianism, which is going to be another party. So, I mean, these guys, when they thought about party, they thought of English history. They had a vision of... Of two parties going. Okay, I'll be easy on myself. Please I agree. Yeah, there you go. Should be very easy on yourself. Yes, sir, right there. In your research, did you find George Washington either formally or informally trying to influence the 96 election? I think that he allowed him, but as this happened with a lot with him, uh, he, he didn't, he wasn't consciously trying to, but he went along with stuff that certainly was an effort to. Um, and one section that I actually dropped out mostly the, of this talk that I give sometimes is is the farewell address, right? Which the farewell address, now we read it as this great, uh, you know, pain to nonpartisanship and this thing we look back as this. And it's actually like a nasty partisan speech, right? That Hamilton, and one, from one point of view, right? If you know who's being referred to and what's being referred to, then uh, basically saying parties are terrible if you're the opposition, right? Who would do that? Uh, and of course, it's the other aspect of it is that Hamilton gets Washington to delay the announcement like all summer, right? In other words, Washington, of course, had wanted out in 1792 and he'd wanted to announce his, that he was stepping down for a long time. Hamilton explicitly keeps uh, saying, I mean, you know, first he delays him by saying, well, I don't have time to work on the final text yet. I'll get back to you in July. Uh, and then uh, he finally just, uh, he, you know, he allows Hamilton to kind of stall this throughout the summer. And Hamilton was doing that specifically because he didn't want to give any other candidates a chance to go, right? Because no one could say anything about being a candidate as long as George uh, was in place. Uh, so allowing, allowing the farewell, of his, his resignation announcement not to come out till three, two months, three months before the election, uh, that, you know, that's an act of partisanship, certainly. It's not pro-Jefferson, for sure. Um, otherwise, I think he mostly stays out of it, though policy-wise, he was obviously quite Federalist by this time. Yeah, that, uh, that's great. Uh, just a, a note on this point, we just recently acquired, at, at, in the auctions of, uh, I guess the last week at, at Christie's, there's a great auction of a letter George Washington written to Edward Carrington in Virginia in the spring oh, of 1996, right. and he's basically saying, I want it to be known that uh, this opposition to the J Treaty in the House, where they're going to pretend that they can't fund it as a way to stall right. it, its operation, he sees that as against the intent of the framers. Yep. Uses those he's, words he, yes. and he says it would make us all fools if that's if we had intended the Senate and yeah, the President to make treaties and then allowed the House to delay them. And this is a political letter that you know he wants Kerry to basically to spread this around. Spread the word Virginia that Virginia and to all points south, basically. So he, he is a political animal. And that is the season, you know, where people are, are, are mobilizing, you know, around these issues that are going to have an impact in the presidency and the presidential election. So he's definitely, you know, on the side of what he would consider the right side. You know, right. A good government. And, and I think Jeff, just Jeff Book really brings that out. I mean, he brings out the idea of, let's get, we have to get away from this idea of anybody really standing above uh, in, that, in that election year. It really is much more familiar to us than, than, uh, well, than people have suggested. And the other thing is the appearance of being above was itself a part of, you know, that was a stance you were going for, right? Because... It still is, although not as to, useful. <laughs> not as useful. People still try that all the time, right? But, it, but it, yeah. you know, in Washington, that was one of the things he was very good at. Tac you know, sometimes partisan tactics that he's very good at. Yeah, and I guess that would be also one big kind of question and push up on, uh, here we are at Mount Vernon. The one thing that is so different, obviously, in that the politics of that period and ours is the unanimity around Washington's presidency for two terms, the unanimous election. I mean, it's just kind of unheard of, although I guess Monroe's pretty close later on too, right? But, uh, you know, Reagan does pretty well, right? It's pretty close to having all the I don't know if the Mondale is easy to me. Well, Mondale doesn't even exist, turn over. Anyway, good question. Yes, sir. Wait for the microphone, please. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, I forgot to say that. I'm just wondering if you could explain a little more. Is that conditional ratification of the Senate? About, about the J Treaty? Yeah. Uh, well, they, what they try to do is, it's quite lame, really. It's quite strained. And uh, they, uh, 
Their argument cause was that uh, there were certain commissions that in the treaty calls for certain commissions to be created. Specifically, one of them had to do with uh, adjudicating Ameri you know, debts, pre-war debts. So the idea was that if you denied the appropriations for the commissions to be formed, you could stop the treaty from being implemented and, in fact, stop the treaty. Uh, so the treaty has already been ratified. It's already been agreed to. They're basically just trying to like sort of mess it up, you know, uh, ma and make it so that the British will be get mad and reject it. Is kind of their idea. But it's it's a it's a shred, you know. And, and they, uh, it's I mean, and probably it's I don't know what the it, it was a. And it's it's one of those moments though when you know the Constitution you know the Constitution is really being written in the 1790s and after. I mean, I, I kind of think the real Constitution is written in the 1790s in the early, in the early 19th century uh, when things that are spelled out one way, you know, they could have easily gone. I mean, that vote, they almost, the Republicans almost won that vote against the Ridge Jay Treaty and, you know, and, and uh, they could have established the idea. I, say, I said it's lame, of course. You put it another way, it sounds actually much better, which is uh, democratic control over foreign policy, right? That, for, that the, 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 the branch of government that actually people can actually vote for would have some control over foreign policy. But constitutionally, the reed they were standing on was really, really thin. If you stand on the reed, I forget if it was. Oh, people love this doing these things. And I don't know that I can do after talking for an hour, and uh, I don't know that I can really intelligently uh, run into too many alternate scenarios for you. But but com totally right. Um, I mean, in, in essence, 1796 is an alternate. Al you know, if the if there's no uh, if Virginia has, has a winner take all in 1796, then Jefferson doesn't lose that electoral vote. Uh, you know, the fact that the winner take all system existed, I'm pretty sure Jefferson does win. Because uh, so you have to subtract Maryland because Adams won most of, and then you have but then you have to add North Carolina, uh, add one from Pennsylvania, add the one from Virginia, you know. So that's that's the kind of thing you get into. Uh, but uh, I mean, no, a lot of them could have could have easily turned out differently. But there's so many multiple. I guess the reason I shy away from this question is there's so many multiple parts of these kinds of things that uh, you know you probably wouldn't just change one. Uh, another one that some type people sometimes make up is say is well what about the three fifths clause? If Jefferson, if uh, there hadn't been the three fifths clause, wouldn't Adams have won handily? Well, um, see the thing is the thing is that it's that's actually not quite clear what the alternative is. On the one hand, uh, do you count are the slaves of the South are they like the women and children of of the whole of all the country who are counted as a full? vote for purposes of representation even though they don't vote? Or are they zero? Are they zero? Uh, and you know, the, the effects of the effects are actually quite different no matter whichever way you, you put that. So uh, you know, alternate scenarios are very, uh, and, and unfortunately this whole thing about the statewide, about the uh, winner take all stuff, about the, how the states still out the electoral, electoral votes, that's like completely, it's completely in flux for like the first 30, 40 years. I mean, there are maps and charts where they're literally deciding every election, you know, a, a year before, or six months before, or two months before, you know, what's going it's, to, it's, it's like who's in charge of the legislature and what arrangement do we think is going to win for our candidate? So what, what are the states today that split? Maine splits today, right? Uh, it's kind of a thing, it's coming back. Yeah. I, I don't know that I have it. I think Nebraska did. Nebraska. Losers always want to bring the district thing back. I mean, you know, the Federalists, when they, when they wanted to amend what became the 12th Amendment, when they wanted to fix the Electoral College, right. they wanted a district method that was sort of, because that was going to be their only chance to put a national coalition together in the foreseeable future. Well, yeah, it, it just certainly allows for more uh, rights for the, the minority voting bloc, right? Yeah, you know, right. But. Okay, so, uh, yes, ma'am, right there. Um, you mentioned that uh, the democracy of the United States was really fast established uh, and uh, worked pretty well in comparison to the French right, for instance. And uh, my question is, uh, does it have to do with the political culture uh, of uh, the United States, of the uh, yeah, population, or how would you explain why it works well? 
Well, I don't know if I would say it worked so well. I think it barely worked. And I thought I'd said the Constitution, the electoral system was broken immediately. Uh, you know, I think it kind of, it's, it's sort of accidental. And, you know, the, the idea that the uh, American political system worked better than the French is compared to what, right? Yes, the American political system worked bad, better compared to mass death and dictatorship, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> you, know, in other, in other words, in other words uh, yes, we avoided the reign of terror. We didn't end up with a dictator. Uh, so good on us. That doesn't necessarily mean, I, but I, I don't think I would say, given the, given the extreme gulf between the way they thought it would work and the way it ended up working, I guess I would tend to not use the word well for how it works. It, it keeps on, right, and doesn't break down massively, of course, until, you know, except for the part about uh, keeping slavery together for, for almost a century and then having to have a bloody war to resolve that. So, you know, even the keeping on part is a, certainly an open question. Yeah, but I th certainly think that you know they, they the Americans were you know they were familiar with the British system of popular government. They had the, the colonies had a form of popular government in which property was represented in government, and that you know and that there's some continuities there. Whereas the French, uh, the breakdown of the Ancien Regime was a dramatic transformation of political culture, in which they had really no experience of popular right. government in that same way. So yeah, well, this is the the Jack Green. The sort of Jack Green approach that it's all the British, right? That the British had, that, that learned everything they knew about most of what they knew in terms of political culture and about how to how to run a free government from the British and just didn't get too far away from that. But I mean, I think there's there's a lot there's a lot to that. Like I said, like I say, my my uh, I just find that I'm more comfortable with the idea of, of treating this all as kind of contingent that we know it worked. But they didn't know it worked, and uh, the, some of the things that they happened just barely, and, and even though it, that we have to kind of be, even, we can look back, and obviously I, I like to look at continuities, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think, uh, I just don't think in terms of like, of whether, I don't think in terms of success or failure, I guess. <laughs> do, we have, do we have one final one? Because if you don't, I have one final one. Professor Pasley. Pasley, yeah. And that would be, so, you're a very smart guy. You've written about the, the you know, your, your tyranny of the British. Where is this, is, where is it coming from? Okay. Political culture, emphasis on, you know, the popular character right. of political culture. So what surprised you that in, the, in putting this book together? I mean, when you began the project, what were you after? And what was the thing that you really, uh, you know, came across or came upon that you said, ah, well, that's, that's an interesting way I need to rethink this. Or was there any of that? Oh, there's definitely surprising things. Uh, I mean, to be honest, the story of how this book came to be is I thought it was going to be like a little pamphlet, you know, that I, I'd written an encyclopedia article. Small essay on the book. Yeah, uh, just a little essay, just a little book, you know, just a little book. You know, that just take just like a summer uh, to write because I'd already written, you know, a, a encyclopedia article on the election of 1796. I thought I kind of knew everything about it. And it was just a question of writing it down, and then it turned out I didn't know anything about it. Or, and also it turned out that it didn't. Though I think the hardest part is is there's there's really no narrative to it in the usual way. You know, there's no. Uh, you can't start like a year before the election and have it make any sense. Uh, there's no nomination process, right? So it's you, you know kind of charged with doing the making of the president 1796, but it can't have the plot that those, the ready-made plot that every, you know, literally every other presidential election book ever has got this kind of like ready-made plot and I didn't have that. So trying to figure out how to kind of block it out uh, was, 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 was a challenge. And I, and I guess I was, I was, I was definitely, I, I tried to express a couple times in the talk, I was quite shocked by Cut and Run. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was quite shocked by how familiar William L. Smith's I mean, this is very, you know, I was writing this during the 2008 election, in case you can't tell. Uh, and some of the things that were deployed uh, in the, those pres the, the 21st century presidential elections, especially by conservatives against the Democrats, were just like, really seemed so reminiscent of some of the types of things that uh, William, William L. Smith was writing that it just made me start to think more in terms of a, a a tradition, at least, of conservative and liberal rhetoric. You know, at least a conservative. 
uh, I don't know if rhetoric's the word. You know, there is, it's a it's a it's because certainly the people who are being conservative changes at different times, but at least there's a certain constellation of ideas uh, and arguments that gets directed. Uh, yep, Jefferson has that great quote that the two parties have existed throughout all time, right? The aristocrats versus the people. There is a, a, a well, that's the other side. That, that's the other. You know, that's that's yeah, the, the that's that that's the the one that the left turns against the right, which is that it's all about it's all about her. and there is some kind of aristocracy versus the, uh, versus the people, right? Whoever without without necessarily defining that very well. Well, fantastic, edifying, excellent, all those adjectives you can come up with. Let's give uh, Jeffrey a big round. Thank you. Housekeeping, we have books for sale. If you don't already have one, right outside the door there. Uh, Professor Pasley is going to sit here and sign them. I will not allow him to leave until all the books okay. are done. Okay. Do you have my room? Uh, he'll be enthusiastic for